In a previous video, I covered the turret layouts of pre-dreadnoughts and dreadnought battleships, and bow cruisers. In this video, I will cover those of interwar battleships, though in this case it will focus only on a handful of ships. After all, past a certain point, most ships begin to follow the exact same layout, differing mostly in caliber of guns and number of guns per turret. And I've already covered the reasons for that in a turret design video. Though again, some exceptions do apply. First though, to bring up a comment on the previous video. Agincourt is a tad different from most turret farmers. She was originally a Brazilian ship, intended to have as much firepower on one hull as possible, since this is a way that a navy that couldn't easily afford a lot of battleships could get the most guns possible. When you have a limited ability to procure number of hulls, Concentrating as much firepower as possible in the smallest number of ships starts looking more attractive. There was also a certain propaganda value to her. The previous Brazilian dreadnoughts had 6 turrets and 12 guns, money precluding them going up to a larger gun caliber. So the only way to point at this still hilariously expensive dreadnought and say to the public that she was quote-unquote, stronger than the older ones, was to go for one more turret and two more guns. This is not to say it doesn't come with issues all on its own. A turret farm is going to inherently have problems. You need to have a much longer ship with a consequently much larger target to armor. This often does not result in a lighter armored ship, simply because the tonnage starts becoming prohibitive if you try to armor such a hull the same as a shorter ship. Furthermore, the ship becomes a bit unwieldy due to the long length, not even getting into dry dock issues. And you might get into issues with bending and warpage as well, depending on how strong you're building the hull. An issue that is overplayed, especially with Agincourt, is the idea that firing all those guns off puts strain on the hull. Provided the ship is built properly, it really shouldn't, though with that many guns going off at once, you can be forgiven for thinking it would. It will lead to issues with routing steam and such, though. Heating up your powder because you have to put magazines next to steam pipes is never a fun experience. The Japanese, in particular, had real issues with this on their turret farm battleships. But yes, there is a certain logic to why Agincourt is the way she is. Not that it changes the fact that she's a bit of a flawed design. Moving along to the main topic of this video, interwar designs are an interesting bunch. Continuing more or less along the lines of late Great War designs, at first, before becoming their own thing under the limitations of the Washington Treaty. The aforementioned late war designs were, broadly, continuations of existing pre-war designs. You see the same twin or triple turrets, France aside, and the same all centerline layout. There's some weird ducks here, like the Courageous class with their twin dual turrets and a reversion to pre-dreadnought layouts, or the original design of their half-sister Furious with her two great honking big 18-inch guns, or Renown with three twin turrets. Okay, most of the real deviations here came from Britain, at least in regards to ships that were actually completed. Beyond that, though, that trend would continue, the British doing their own thing, to some extent had we seen the N3 and G3 designs come to fruition. These ships would have had a somewhat interesting layout. All the guns concentrated on the bow, akin to the old Victoria-class design, but not quite the same. In the case of both of those ships, you had three triple turrets, which would have been the first triple turrets on any British battleship, two mounted in a super-firing pair ahead of the bridge structure, and one directly behind it, but ahead of the rest of the superstructure. This is perfectly fine for broadsides, though I shudder to think of the arcs of fire if you want to fire directly ahead or directly astern. Then again, there's always a logic to these things. Broadside fire was the goal as was a certain desire to keep the ships, which would otherwise be massive and were still pretty big, to a size that could use existing dockyards. Concentrating everything forward allowed for shorter and lighter ships for the same capability than a more traditional design. We'll see that logic come back in later. Past this, and leaving aside the weirdness of the Tillmans, which are covered in the turret history video, or the French, the other major navies were doing more or less traditional designs. The South Dakotas were basically just 16-inch triple turret versions of the existing standards. The Amagi or Tosa or Key were pretty standard too. 
five twin turrets, which is about what you'd expect of super dreadnoughts in the British style. The same would have been true for the German L-20s or their later GK designs, or the Italian super dreadnoughts, or the Austrian super dreadnoughts, which would have been the even more average turret layout of four turrets, be they twin or triple. As for the French, well, they continue their proud tradition of just doing whatever they want. Normandy would have had three all center line turrets, none of which were super firing, all of which would have been the first quad turrets to come close to entering service. Similar to Agincourt, this came about to get the most firepower without increasing gun caliber. You see the logical conclusion of this concept in the follow on Lyon, wherein the French decided that 12 guns weren't enough, so they went for four quad turrets and no fewer than 16 guns with some ideas for 20 12-inch guns. But, in all cases here, the Washington Treaty put a lid on that. None of these would be completed. You don't see a new American or Japanese battleship until, basically, World War II. The Germans, French, and Italians squeeze them in, but even then, not until the 1930s. The British are the only ones to squeeze in a new battleship in the 20s, and those were the Nelsons which continue where the G3 and N3 would have gone, but ditching the turret behind the bridge in favor of all three turrets forward. A concept the French would later follow, albeit with one fewer turret. As previously mentioned, the advantage to this layout is primarily in shortening your armored citadel. You have a shorter ship for the same amount of firepower and can, even on top of that, focus the armor into a yet smaller area because all your turrets and magazines are right next to each other. There are disadvantages to this design too, naturally, especially for firing to your stern. But for weight saving, kinda hard to beat. Which is of course why it became somewhat popular for a bit there. The Washington Treaty, even once it allowed for new construction, put pretty severe weight caps on battleship design. An all forward layout allowed for a more effective ship on those weight limitations. This is why you see Richelieu, I think, often come up as one of the best battleships, at least of the Treaty Era. The French would be the nation to most fully embrace all forward gun layouts, doing it on both of their Treaty battleship designs, albeit with only two quad turrets instead of three triples. Again, when you have to take into account limited dockyard space, or you're trying to get the most efficient design possible while holding to the Treaty, or you're trying to get the most firepower and armor on the smallest ship as possible. Any of those situations, an all-forward gun layout makes pretty good sense. There are definitely sacrifices to be made. You obviously can't fire directly astern. You're concentrating all your guns in one spot, so if you get hit there, you are putting a big risk in those magazine storage areas. It's just not quite a perfect layout, though it does have its advantages. In any event, you see turret layouts shift in other ways to continue to try and fit this weight limit. Most notably, in the ever-popular 3x3 layout. Three triple turrets, two on the bow, and one on the stern. Or the sister idea of doing the same thing, but with twins or quads, depending. The first ships to really do this layout with twin turrets were the Renowns, but once the Washington Treaty hits, it goes full tilt. Everyone is doing this to some level or another, except for the French. And even they probably would have done it had they finished the Alsace. This layout also saves a certain amount of weight and space, but allows for firing to the stern. It also has some improvements in stability and not concentrating all the weight in one area. Moreover, you can spread your magazines out and build a more traditional hull form. In absolute terms, both layouts have their advantages and disadvantages. In practical terms, well, other than the French, and the Germans who insist on four twins after Scharnhorst, everyone goes to this layout or some variation of it. The Americans, perhaps, are the ones to most enthusiastically embrace it. Every completed American battleship class, post-Washington Treaty, uses three triple turrets in this layout. North Carolina, which admittedly almost had quad turrets in this layout, were it not for invoking the treaty's escalator clause, South Dakota and Iowa all followed this design. It was what the United States Navy settled on as the most efficient way for them to follow treaty limits while retaining firepower and tactical flexibility. It should be noted here, it's not really what they wanted. 
you see this with the Montana immediately reverting to going for four triple turrets and 12 guns, exactly what the USN had attempted in the 1920s with the old South Dakota design. As I mentioned in the turret design history, the thing to remember about the USN when it comes to battleships, or cruisers, or destroyers, surprisingly not submarines though, they always want as many guns as humanly possible on a single hull as possible without going for full-out turret farms after the standards came around. This is why you see them use triple turrets all the time. This is why you see Montana immediately revert to four triple turrets. Always assume, if you're looking at a United States Navy design, that they want to get as many guns as possible, whether it be main caliber guns or anti-aircraft guns. Meanwhile, across two other oceans, you can see the same sort of thing coming up with the 3x3 layout. The Japanese, of course, followed this design in Yamato, just with their massive 18-inch guns. Similar logic here for them in regards to weight and flexibility. Which is also why you see the so-called Super Yamato going for three twin turrets, but with bigger guns. The Italians, for their part, did the same with the Littorio class. They were, in fact, the first navy to go with this turret layout, not the Americans. Though with typically fascist Italian construction times, they were beat out by Germany in getting their ships commissioned, which is why the Scharnhorse are the first battleships to actually be built with this design. In of themselves, the Scharnhorse are interesting, being the only German capital ships, and no, the Panzerschiff are not capital ships no matter how many times you call them pocket battleships, to use triple turrets. German naval designers during the Imperial period would, off and on, think about using triples, but never seriously push for it. German naval designers seem to loathe the idea for capital ships, at least in most cases. Late Imperial designs still retain twin turrets, and Bismarck, of course, reverted to it. The German logic of spreading the guns out to avoid losing too many guns to any one turret hit I'm not going to say they're wrong, but I'm also not going to say it's the most effective or best use of tonnage. There's many reasons Bismarck is as hilariously overweight as she is, but her turret layout is definitely the big one. The final navy to go with the three turret layout were the British with the KGVs and the admittedly never finished Lion class. The latter were never finished, of course, and the former have an interesting layout all of their own what with two quad turrets and one twin turret. This was done because of weight and stability concerns, since the original design definitely wanted three quad turrets. But because of top weight issues with this, and other issues they would soon find out, the ships reverted to a single twin for their super-firing 14-inch guns, leaving the two quads for the lower turrets. These ships would have continuing issues with this weird layout, but that's a story for their own video. It's also where this video, which is admittedly shorter than the last one, comes to an end. Again, there's not as much experimentation in this era. No other turret layouts for battleships were really considered past this point. It was all either three or four turrets, with the exception of the French, and either twin, triple, or quad guns. There was variation between the different navies, but really we're past the point of trying to play around and figure out what the best turret layout is. The final note I'll make with this video is, in spite of all these experiments, it would be perhaps the simplest layout of the Dreadnought Age that finished the era of big gun capital ships. HMS Vanguard with her four twin super-firing turrets. This was, admittedly, because of the fact she was a rush build using the turrets pulled off the Courageous Sisters in their conversion to carriers so she had to use twin turrets of Great War Vintage. But it's still funny how it works out, that the simplest of all Dreadnought layouts becomes the one that ends the era. Thank you for watching. Remember to like, subscribe, and comment if you like the content, and I'll see you in the next one.